Um, in January, I know it was a couple months ago, but in January we started a series called The Struggle is Real. The Struggle is Real. Um, how many are liking the new TV? I'm just going to give it a hug for a minute. Is that wrong? Yeah. Um, the other TV went kaput, and I don't know what that means, but it did. And so we decided to get a nice one. And um, I don't know if some of you guys know this. Do you know why we have this up here? Like some people ask me, like, why do you, there's a screen right behind you. Why? If you watch online, you can't see the screen. Uh, some of you are like, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. So what this is for is for those that are watching online right now, including my mom who had surgery uh, Friday. Everything went well. Everything's good. We appreciate the prayers and the support. And uh, she's watching online and she can see the big TV because they can't see the screen. So we do this for that. And I like it anyways. I just love referencing it. So, all right. So we started a series first of the year called The Struggle is Real. It's on spiritual warfare. And we said this, the Christian life is a battleground, not a playground. And too many people, too many believers think it's a playground. Like, oh, everything's just happy and lucky and great and awesome. And there's a spiritual battle going on and we need to be aware of it. And so I'm going to give you just some highlights of some of the sermons that we did. Week one, we said this, when you put on the armor of God, you're dressing in God's power. We just took a week and we talked about just what it is to do spiritual warfare and what the armor is. And then the next week, uh, we said knowing your enemy is one of the secrets to winning the battle. And we talked, and I don't like doing this a whole lot, but we just talked about Satan and what his plan is for you and how he wants to deceive you and discourage you and get you off track. And then uh, week, um, week three, we finally got into the actual armor of God. We looked at the belt of truth and we said truth must be absolute. It has to be outside of yourself. You can't decide what true is because you're human. You're finite. We need it from somebody who's infinite, and that's God. And he has laid out for us truth. It's in God's word. And so it has to be absolute. Truth can never be relative. It can never be subjective to you, to what you're feeling, because one day you might feel like you're all in for God, and the next day you feel very discouraged. And so truth is truth. It's God's standard. And we talked about the belt of truth and having that and why it's the first piece that he mentions. And then we talked about the breastplate of righteousness. And we said righteousness is the standard by which God requires people to become acceptable to him. And you can never reach that standard. I can never reach that standard. God, we, remember this? Remember this word? God imputed, remember this? Imparted his righteousness upon us. When we become a follower of Jesus, it's not our righteousness. God actually gives us Jesus' righteousness. And when he views you, you are righteous. And we talked about the breastplate of righteousness. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the gospel of peace that are on our feet, that we need a firm foundation. What's on a soldier's feet provides foundation and stability, that you can have peace in the midst of chaos, that your feet can be secure and be steady in the midst of whatever storm arises in your life. And then last week, Pastor Gwen came up and she did an amazing job on the shield of faith. And I don't know if you caught this at the end of her message. And I was standing in the back because I love to, when I'm not speaking, I love to stand in the back and shake hands. Uh, I was standing in the back and uh, she said this right at the end. She said, oh, it's funny. I talked about the shield of faith, but I didn't even get a chance to go into the fiery darts. And I thought for a moment as I was standing there, we need to hit that. And so I was scheduled this week to do the sword of the spirit. That's our next piece of armor. But I want to just take a break and talk more about the shield of faith. Is that okay? You don't have a choice. I'm just asking because I'm a nice guy. <laughs> I'm going to do it whether you say here or not. But I wanted to, and I know Pastor Gwen, she did a great job on little faith and strong faith and great faith, and her message was great. But listen, the shield of faith is the biggest piece of armor we have. And that's not to say it's more important than anything else, but so much hinges on the shield of faith. And this is the only one of the pieces of the armor where Paul tells us what it does. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't tell us what the belt of truth is. He says, just put it on. He doesn't tell us what the breastplate of righteousness does. He just says, put it on. He doesn't say the gospel of peace on your feast or the helmet of salvation we did a couple weeks ago. He doesn't do any of that. What he does is he says, the shield of faith, you pick it up, you use it to quench all the fiery darts or arrows from the enemy. Isn't that interesting? And so I want to take some time and talk about that. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. But listen, here's the point. And, and we said it's the, it's the biggest. You can go back. Yeah. A soldier's shield was his biggest and greatest defense. Do you understand that? You need to get that this morning. When we're talking about faith, this is your greatest defense. This is your biggest piece of armor 
that will block things that the enemy will shoot at you. And we'll talk about what they are later. And so we need to know this. We need to to have this. We need to have a shield of faith. Our faith needs to be strong and solid and growing and maturing. So here we go. Would you stand for the reading of God's word if you can? Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. You should know this, right? Do you know the first two verses? Thank you. Thank you, because we're memorizing this. We'll get into that later. But finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. Here we go. He's going to list them. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, some translations say above all, above all. In addition to all this, listen, listen. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We'll get into that next week. And then the final week, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people. Let's pray together. Jesus, we call upon you because we believe that you hear us and that our prayers are answered. And God, would you today, through your Spirit, encourage our faith? Would you enlarge our faith? Would you let us see the importance of what faith, the role of faith plays in our walk with you? God, we put our faith, our trust, our confidence in you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. You may be seated. I find it very interesting that this is the only piece of armor that says what it does. All the other pieces are just mentioned, but for some reason, Paul says this, that above all, above all, look at the verse, verse 16. Above all, this is the King James Version. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts or arrows of the wicked one. Take up the shield of faith. Have faith in God because your faith will extinguish the things that the enemy shoots at you. When Paul mentions the belt of truth or the helmet of salvation or the gospel of peace on our feast, he doesn't get into detail what they do. He just says put them on. And we can look at what the word is. And I think Pastor Gwen did a great job last week of talking about the difference between symbols and substance. It's not the symbol. It's not the belt. It's really truth. It's not the breastplate. It's righteousness. It's not, you know, it's not nice Nike shoes. Come on, somebody, right? Some, some really nice shoes. It's the gospel of peace that's your foundation. It's the actual, um, uh, not symbols, but substance. But here, for some reason, Paul goes into detail and he says, with the shield, you can quench all, not some, not most, but all the fiery darts that the enemy shoots at you. If if you want to follow along, I put my notes in your bulletin, but I, I put this in there. And we need to kind of have a working definition of what faith is. What is faith? What is faith? Pastor Gwen talked about it a little little bit last week, but what is faith? Here's kind of my working definition of faith. That faith is confidence in who God is and what God said. Isn't that good? That, that, That faith is this trust, this belief, this confidence that God is who he says he is and that his word is true. That's faith. That's belief. We need that. Faith believes and trusts that God is who he said he is. That he is almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, Lord of all. Faith is believing that that is true. And faith is this assurance that his word is true as well. That what he said and how we get to know Jesus, even though he lived 2,000 years ago through the Gospels, is true. There was a missionary, his name was John Patton. And he had this real calling to go into a third world country and go to a tribe that had no, um, no translation of the Bible. 
And so he went on this mission field and he learned the language, the local language of the people, and he decided that he was going to translate the Bible into their language. There was just one problem. They had no word for faith. So as he's learning the language, they had no word for this idea of faith or belief. It wasn't in their language. And so he wrestled because faith is just mentioned so many times in God's Word. Do you know it's in every single book of the Bible? Faith. It's either mentioned or we see it. People believing and trusting God. And so John Patton had this dilemma, like, what do I do? And so one day, up in his study, as he's translating the Bible, one of the young men comes running up into his room and kind of plops down in the chair. And he says this. Listen, he says this. It's good to rest my whole weight in this chair. It's good that I'm able to rest, he said in his language, my whole weight in this chair. And at that moment, John Patton knew exactly what faith was. Faith was this whole weight that you put on God. Like, I am all in with God. That I believe and I trust and my confidence is in you. It's this idea of having your whole weight trusting who God is. And so that's what he went on to translate the word faith or trusting or belief. This idea that you all in, your whole weight, everything that you are, that you believe in God and believe his word, who he is, and what he says he will do. It's believing. Next week, we're going to get into the sword of the Spirit, which I'm excited about. I love talking about God's word. But the Bible was given to us as an instruction manual for his followers. That God has given us his word. He's written a book so that we will know about him. And know more about him. And one reason God wrote a book is so that your faith and my faith can be encouraged. Romans 10, 17, do you know what it says? You should. It's a great verse. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes by hearing God's word. Do you understand today that your faith should be enlarged because of what is taught here today? Not because it's me, because it's God's word. That your faith every day when you get up in the morning or when you, before you go to bed and, and you just take a minute and you read a little bit of God's word, whether you have it on your, on your phone or you have it in a book. I just got a new devotional. I just feel like I wanted to mix things up. And so I bought a new devotional by an author I like. And I just started reading it every day along with some of the other stuff I read. But every time you read God's word, every time you hear a message, maybe if you have a commute, you put on a, like a podcast or a message or you know something else that you want to hear, you are increasing your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes through hearing God's word and getting it in you. And are you ready for this? And memorizing it. You know where I'm going with this, right? (laughs) Everybody's like, "Mm mm-hmm, we know where you're going. We decided this year as a church that we are going to learn 12 verses, one for each month. How's it going? January, January, don't put it up, Brianna, don't put it up. I want to see if we can, we can figure it out. January, our verse was Ephesians 6, 10 and 11. Finally, come on, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil or the devil's schemes or whatever translation you learned. That was January. And then February, come on. February was 2 Thessalonians 3.3. Come on, somebody give it to me. Come on. The Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Put it up. Do we have it? Put that one up. Yeah. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Do you understand when you memorize that, when you get that in your spirit and something comes up, you're like, wait a minute. God is faithful. God's faithful. He's going to protect me. He's going to strengthen me. I'm going to be able to get through this. And now that it is March, we are learning a new verse. I kind of, this is a great verse. I wanted to put it up higher, but it's such a longer verse. I I wanted to kind of space them out between the first month and the third month. But we're learning uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. I need a little help. I'm still learning it. Don't want to embarrass myself, right? But I know the gist of it. But can you put it up? The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to what? demolish strongholds. And then it tells us what strongholds are, right? We demolish every argument and pretense, anything that's opposed to God's word. 
that sets itself up against the knowledge of who God is, and we take every thought captive and what? And make it obedient to Christ. We take that thought captive. If you weren't here two weeks ago, we did the helmet of salvation. If you weren't here, you need to go back and listen to that message. We dove into this verse. How our minds are a battlefield, and Satan wants to go after us. We're going to talk a little bit about these darts that he shoots at us. A lot of times he shoots at us in our mind to get us to think that God can't be trusted. You should, you should do what you want to do. And that they are just darts from the enemy. So I hope you're memorizing those. And what we're doing when we choose to memorize Scripture, we are increasing our faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so we are increasing our faith. We are building our faith. God can be trusted. God protects us. God strengthens us. And when thoughts come in that are not of him, we take it captive. We make it obedient to Christ. We say, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to go to this particular place. I'm not going to hang out with these people because they're, 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 they're danger for me. This is what's happening as we begin to learn God's word. When we memorize, when we memorize these verses, it increases our faith. Like I said, I put my notes in your bulletin. I just have two, two points today. Two thoughts for you if you want to write these down. These are good. Um, faith keeps us in line with God, and faith keeps us from giving into temptation. Faith keeps us in line with God, aligned with God, but it also keeps us from giving into temptation. Let's look at the first one. Faith keeps us in line. Paul says, above all, take the shield of faith. Take the shield of faith. That is not to say that faith is the most important piece of armor, but it's to say it's the one that is out front. It is the one that is significant. It's very important, your faith, your trust, your confidence. Remember what we said faith was? It's confidence in who God is and what he said. And so above all, take the shield of faith. So I got a couple pictures for you. Just uh, if we could put up the picture of the Roman soldier. Yeah, this is a different picture. I mean, I don't know how accurate it is, but they, the shield was a very large piece of, of either metal or wood, and they would put leather on it and other things. And uh, that was the thing that protected them the most. They wore the breastplate around their chest. They wore a helmet of salvation. You know, they wore things on their feet so they had foundation. But they had this shield that when arrows would come or when they were in a close battle with someone with a sword, they had this shield that would block. And it's pretty amazing. I don't know if you watch... Um, I've seen it in movies. I've seen it in TV shows. They have this thing called a shield wall. Have you anybody heard of this? You see this in movies. I, I saw it the other day. The, uh, one of the Hobbit movies was on. I don't know if you saw that, but they have this one army that has the shield wall. If you could put up the picture. It's this idea of community. Listen, this is important. Community coming together to protect each other. That's what faith is. That's why we encourage you to get involved in a small group. I just talked to someone in our church, uh, a young lady in her 20s, and she's going she's gonna, to, when we do small groups again after Easter, um, she's going to do a young adult small group for like 20s and maybe early 30s or whatever, and just maybe you're single or married or whatever. What a great thing. That's what you're doing with your faith. You're not just protecting yourself. There are times in community where you have to protect others. And so it's this idea of faith keeps us in line with who God is, who he is. The Apostle Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. I don't know if you're aware of that. But he says that our faith is our shield. It's the biggest piece. It's the biggest piece. I put this in your notes, if you could put it up. The Christian life from start to finish is all about faith. The Christian life from start to finish, from beginning to end, is really all about your faith, all about your trust, all about your confidence in God. The Christian life begins with faith. You put your faith in Jesus. And if you haven't done that today, I would love to pray with you at the end of service right near the piano. I would love to introduce you to Christ. If you've never surrendered your life to Christ, today is a great day. But that is putting your confidence, your faith, in who Christ is. But not only in the start, there's also faith at the end. Because you see, I hate to tell you this, but you're going to die. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Isn't that great? You're going to die. Will you believe that there is a God who created a heaven for you and for me? I believe that. The Christian life from start to finish is all about faith. 
It begins with faith and it ends with faith. That we have to have the faith and the trust that when we breathe our last breath, that we will go on to eternity with God in heaven. Isn't that a great thing? Isn't that a great thing, heaven? Okay, you guys are awake, right? Do you want me to start over again? I can start from the beginning and we can just start over again. Oh, now you're awake. Now he's like, no, no, we just keep going. We're good. Faith keeps us in line with who God is. And what's interesting about the shield of faith is if you don't pick it up, it's no good. Please get this this morning. If you don't, if you don't activate your faith, if you don't activate your faith, it's no good to you. If you're not believing and trusting God for things right now in your life, your faith is not being stretched like a muscle. It needs to be. You have to take up the shield of faith. You have to pick it up. You have to activate your faith. You have to make statements that I'm going to trust God in the midst of this. My marriage is struggling. My kids are a mess. I'm going to trust God for this. That is activating your faith. That is picking up your shield and saying, you know what? I'm going to trust God. It must be picked up to be activated. Do you remember a few weeks ago, I, I talked about the difference between the first three pieces and the second? I need to just hit on this real quick. It won't take long. But the verb with the first three are different than the verb for the, the last three. The first three, the verb means to keep on all the time. It's permanent, to never take off. You never take off the breastplate of righteousness. You never take off the belt of truth. You always live by truth. Your feet are always the gospel of peace foundation. You don't take them off. But the second three, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, it's this verb of taking up when you need it. Taking it up when you need it. Now, a soldier wouldn't have his shield up all the time. They wouldn't walk around with their shield up all the time. No. In the midst of battle, they would grab their shield and put it up as needed. Faith is the same way. That's why he links these two. That's why he says it's the shield of faith. When needed, you need to activate your faith. You need to trust God. You need to go to the God's word and get a verse or get something that deals with what you're going through. And we'll talk a little bit about that next week. Because what's interesting, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but what's interesting is there are two words for the word of God. There's two Greek words. One is logos and one is rhema. In this passage, he uses the word rhema, which is a specific word for that moment, for that period of time in your life. That's what God does. That is activating your faith, getting a rhema word from God to trust him and say, you know what, this is happening, but this is what God's word said, and I'm going to believe it. Taking up the shield of faith. Activating that shield. And so the final three pieces, you pick up as needed. The shield, the helmet. They wouldn't wear their helmets all the time. Their helmets were uncomfortable. It would be like me getting up here and preaching in a football helmet. You guys would be like, you're out of your mind. You probably, some of you wouldn't even show up next week. But you don't wear it all the time. You put it on as needed. We talked about that two weeks ago, about our minds and the battle that goes on. We need to put on the helmet of salvation. Next week, we're talking about what it looks like to take up the sword of the Spirit. Take it up and activate it and trust God. But the shield of faith, the belief, the trust, the confidence in God is to be taken up when needed. And it aligns us with who God is and what God has done. I don't know if you've ever driven a car that's out of line. You've got to be older. To, newer cars don't, I, I just don't seem like they get out of line as much. I mean, I guess I've got computers and all this kind of stuff. But my first car was a 1980, come on somebody, Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. Half hard top. You know what I'm saying? Remember the cars when they make that goofy hard top? I don't know why we did that. But it had a hard top on the half of the car. It was a little two-door. Not little. They're all big in the 80s. It was huge. Right? It was a two-door. It sat 15 comfortably. Right? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You could sleep four in the back, just across the back. It was a huge car. Right? But I remember when I got the car, it drove straight. And then after a while, I hit a curb. You ever do this? And it messes up your alignment. And now when I'm driving down the road, the car is just going to the right all by itself. You could let go of the steering wheel and it would just make a right turn. You know what I'm saying? Like it was crazy. But you had to get your, you had to get your alignment. You had to get the, 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 the wheels aligned with where you're going. Do you understand that's what you're doing 
when you, when, you, when you activate your faith, when you take up the shield, you are aligning yourself with who God is. And you're saying, you know what? The world says this, and my friends say this, and my parents say this, and this is not of God. But God says this, and I'm aligning myself to him. I'm getting straight, and I'm going straight. That's what alignment is. That's what we're talking about here. Faith keeps us in line or aligned with who God is. That's what it does. When we're not trusting and believing God, when we're not trusting in his word, we're not memorizing it or being around scripture as we read it daily or hear it preached, what's happening is we are distancing ourselves and our life begins to pull towards sin and pull toward wrong behavior and it's out of line and we've got to get our lives lined up with God's word and memorize. Listen, the Lord is faithful. What a great verse. Whatever you're going through today, listen to me. The Lord is faithful. He can protect you. He can strengthen you. Whatever you're going through, this is why we memorize this word. I prayed yesterday. I took some time as I was putting this all together, and I prayed yesterday, Lord, if there's anyone here today who is not aligned with your word, if there's anyone today that has gotten off just maybe even a little bit, and they're beginning to veer off, God, would you help them align? Would they activate their faith? Would they pick up the shield of faith and align themselves with God's truth, who he is and what he says, that confidence? That was my prayer for you yesterday, that we would align ourselves with God's word. Here's the second thought. If you're taking notes, faith keeps us from getting into temptation. And this is where I want to spend the rest of our time together. This idea of what temptation is. We said earlier that it's the, it's the only armor that Paul gives specific application to. The shield of faith. Look at the verse again. Can you put it up, Rihanna? Above all, above all, take the shield of faith with which, here it is, this is why you take it up, so that you can quench all the fiery arrows or darts that the enemy shoots at you. And listen, he is shooting all the time. You do realize that, right? He wants to get you. He wants his fate to be your fate. He doesn't want you trusting God. He doesn't want you memorizing scripture. He doesn't want you coming to church. He doesn't want you doing your daily devotions. He doesn't want you praying to God. He doesn't want any of that. He wants to get you offline and distance yourself from God. We talked about that a couple years ago in our Hebrew series. I could say a couple years because it took us a year to get through Hebrews. Do you remember this? Right in the beginning, this idea of drifting. Our natural tendency is not to drift toward God. It's to drift away from God. And we have to be taking up our shield. We have to be trusting God. So here's the question. Looking at the verse. What are the fiery darts? If our shield of faith quenches them, what are they? What are they? Here it is. You ready? It's super easy. It's temptation. That's what the enemy is shooting at you. He wants to tempt you. He wants to get you off track. These arrows that your shield of faith can deflect and stop is temptation. And God comes after you, or excuse me, Satan comes after you with temptation. What do you think the evil one is shooting at us? It's to tempt us to do wrong, to not trust God to take things into our own um, hands and say, you know what, God's not, God's not a- acting as fast as I want him to. I've been praying about this for like three days, God, and nothing. Uh-huh. That, was, that was a joke, by the way. Okay, I was playing for three months for this. Sometimes it's three years. Listen, sometimes it's three decades. And I say that because I've had one of those prayers where I prayed since I was a kid. For my uncle to come to Christ. Decades. But he's going to shoot at you temptation. Words. Words like unforgiveness. Or greed. Or fear. Or pride. Or selfishness. Or lust. Or impurity. Or vanity. Or covetousness. All these words that he shoots at us. Listen to this. 1 John 2. I love this verse. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. What a tough verse, right? Don't love the world. Don't be connected. You do realize, 
as nice as your house is and as great as your car is, it's not going to last. Nothing, nothing lasts. It's all going to burn up. It doesn't matter. All your, all your money, all, all your 401k, everything you have, it's going to be gone someday. It's not going to matter in the light of eternity. Don't love the world or anything in the world. For everything in the world, here it is. Ready, ready? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from who? From the world, from Satan himself. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. You could pretty much sum up all the sins that have ever happened in the world in those three things. Lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, self. The pride of life, thinking you're better than someone else. All summed up in in that verse right there. Remember our point here. Faith, faith, our shield keeps us from temptation. Our enemy is constantly tempting us. You don't need to trust God. You can take matters into your own hand. You don't have to live like this. You can live like this. It's okay. You could just ask for forgiveness. I want this morning to look at two temptations in the Bible. And they're very famous. The first temptation in Genesis 3, and then the temptation of Jesus. Can we do that together? If you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 3. I want to see what Satan has planned for us when it comes to temptation. What are the fiery darts that he's shooting at us? And how do we take up the shield? How do we trust, have confidence in God? Genesis 3, if you're there, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? I'm going to underline some stuff here so that you see. There's three things here. Just like Jesus was tempted in three different areas, there's three here, three darts that the enemy shoots at you. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God said, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, which we know, in Gen- I'll read it in a minute, in Genesis 2, it's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They weren't allowed to eat from that. Any other tree, any other tree but that one. Verse 4, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Here it is, if you're taking notes, listen, these three things, three Ds, can you put them up? Um, Satan wants you to doubt God, deny truth, and he wants to deceive you. He wants you to doubt God, deny truth, and then ultimately his, his, his game is always deception. These are the darts. Hear me now. These are the darts the enemy is shooting at, shooting at us. Doubt God. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Is that what God said? No. No. Satan, even in the beginning, is misquoting what God said so that he can get them to doubt Did God really say? Did God really say? You can't eat from any tree. No, that's not what God said. You're twisting, right? You're deceiving. You're getting me to doubt. These are the darts that you need to have your shield of faith on. Then the enemy wants you not only to doubt God, but then he moves to denial. Listen, you won't die. Listen, God said this, but it's not going to happen. This happens to us all the time. The enemy shoots these thoughts, these things, these temptations into our mind to try to get us to doubt God and deny truth. You're not going to die. You'll be fine. Go ahead and sleep around. You'll be fine. Go ahead and have a little addiction on the weekends, but, you know, you can control it. Go go ahead and and, and flirt with that person. Go ahead and do whatever. You you fill in the blank. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's fine. You're not going to die. It's not going to affect you. It might affect somebody else, but not you. You're a strong person. You go to church every week. You even give something in the offering. It's denial. Denial of what God said. God told them to not eat from that specific tree. Genesis 2.17, I said this earlier. He says this, um, but you must not eat uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. There's the verse. There it is. Chapter 4. He says, listen, Anything you want in the garden, anything, anything, that one tree, that one in the middle, you're not to eat of that because you will die. Satan said, you're not going to die. Instead, listen, listen, here's the good news. Here's the good news. You'll be just like God. 
How false is that? What a mess that is. You'll be just like God. The temptation we all face is to deny the truth of God's word. To doubt him and to deny truth. Will you believe the lie that Satan is right and God is wrong? Because that's really it when you boil it down. That's really it. Will you believe God? And then the last one is he says this. He tempts us um, in order to deceive us. He says this in a verse. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Man, you could be in charge. You could be the captain of your ship. You could be the captain of your life. Go ahead. Don't believe God. Don't trust God. Don't live according to God's word. Do whatever you want. Do what feels good. It doesn't matter. It's a secret sin. Nobody knows about it. You can keep it hidden. You'll be fine. It's deception, folks. It's deception, my friends. We will be like God. What a total lie. But that's what fate, Satan does. That's the darts of temptation. In order for us to compromise, in order for us to give into temptation and say something or think something or do something or go somewhere that is completely opposite of what God says. Now, if you would, turn over to Matthew 4, the temptation of Jesus. I'm not going to get into too much of this. We're going to hit on this a little bit next week because we have to. Because the, one of the things of the sword of the Spirit is to, is to um, combat temptation with God's Word. And we'll see that. We'll get into that next week. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of it this week. But I want to read this to you. And I've underlined three different portions. They relate so well to what the first temptation was. To doubt, to deny, and to deceive. Watch this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, here it is, here it is, one of the most profound statements in all the Bible, he was hungry. Duh. I mean, I don't eat for a couple hours. I'm hungry right now. How about you guys? You know what I'm saying? I drank some juice this morning. I tried to juice in the morning for my health. Um, straight up, I'm hungry. Anybody else? Where are we going to lunch? Come on, somebody. And are you buying? So, listen. 40 days, 40 nights, he was hungry. Okay, good. The tempter, Satan, came to him and said, if you are, watch all the statements are if, all the statements are if, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's scripture. That's in the Old Testament. It says this, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God. Don't you notice, too, and I love this, and I talked about this a couple years ago. I did a, I did a series on the um, Apostles' Creed. And one of the things in the Apostles' Creed says that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you notice that Satan addresses him not as Jesus, but as the Son of God? When, he, when Jesus encountered demons, do you know what they said? They didn't say, Jesus, what do you want? Why are you here? Why are you touring? They said, Son of God. Man, listen, you better have it right when it comes to the Son of God. you got to get it right. That's Jesus. He is the Son of God. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command your angels concerning you, and he will lift you up in your hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Which, by the way, is Scripture. Satan's quoting it. Jesus answered, it is written. Here it is. He took out the sword. We'll do that next week. He took out the sword. Do not put the Lord your God to, to the test. And again, the devil took him very to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, all the spoils that come with it. You can have it all, Jesus. All this I will give to you, he said, if you just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. The first temptation, listen, stones to bread. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're the son of God, if I was the son of God, I'd be making some good sourdough. Come on, somebody. Right? Or some, you, know what, you know what? Recently, my wife's been wanting pumpernickel. Do they even make pumpernickel bread anymore? They do? We've got to find it. Right? Bread is the How many? Where are my bread people? Who loves bread? Come on. Wow, that hand went up quick, Christine. She's like, bread me. Count me in. Right? There's my son. We call him a breadaholic. 
Seriously, the, the, the guy will choose bread over anything. He just loves bread. There's nothing wrong. Listen, listen, I want, and, and I'll explain this in just a minute. There is nothing wrong with Jesus turning stones into bread. He is more than capable. But the point is this. Will you trust God or will you not to meet your needs? He could have done it. He could have made some bread. He hadn't eaten in 40 days. Could have made some bread. We had some eggs. Come on, somebody. A little bacon on the side or sausage. I don't know what Jesus likes, but they're delicious, both of them. He could have done all that. He could have just, in a moment, the creator of the universe, it says he spoke and the universe was formed. He could have made the best bread ever. But he didn't. It was a temptation. It was a, hear me, hear me, it was a fiery dart to get him to do something and not trust God. Go ahead, just take matters into your own hands, right? Go ahead, man. God's not working. God's not meeting your needs, so you need to go ahead and meet your own need. You know, God, I got some needs. Yeah, God knows. You got to trust him. It's this thought. I wrote this in my notes. That God has abandoned you, and you are on your own, and so you should make some delicious bread. God has abandoned you. You can't trust him. You're on your own to get this done. And I love Jesus' response is just God's word. Second temptation. Second temptation was to deny truth. Listen, listen. Throw yourself down off the temple, and everyone will see that you are truly the Son of God. Isn't that what God promised you, Jesus? That God would exalt you, that every knee would bow, and every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord. Here's your chance. Take matters into your own hand. Deny truth. Go ahead and do it. Everybody else is doing it. Is denying that God will give you what he promised. That God can't be trusted. That denying truth, denying the truth of God's word. That's what's in play there. Isn't it interesting that all these temptations are the same? He wants you to doubt. No, no, listen, God's not meeting your needs. You need, to, you need to take matters into your own hands. And then deny truth. God says this, but man, I really feel like I want to do this. Here's the last one. It's just, just it's straight up deception. Satan told him to bow and worship him, and he would give him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Here it is. You ready? Don't miss this. I've talked about this before when I did, I, I spoke on the temptations of Jesus. Hey, Jesus, you can skip the cross and I'll give you everything you've ever wanted. You can skip the pain and the suffering and, and, and the abandonment and all that came with it. You can, you can skip dying and doing all that. I will just go ahead and give it to you now if you will just bow down. What deception. You can have all the kingdoms of the world if you just do this one little thing. Just give in to temptation. Just go ahead and bow. It'll be quick. You don't have to stay there long. Just go ahead and bow to me, and I'll give it all to you. And you can skip the pain and the suffering and the difficulty. And Jesus said, not a chance. This is what I was called to do. It's serious, folks. Your shield of faith is so powerful and significant. And you need to be doing everything you can to align yourself, to take it up, to activate your faith and trust God and not give in to the temptations. Do you see the similarities in the, these temptations? The first one and, and the one? Different stories, thousands of years apart. Doubt God. He's not going to take care of your needs. Deny truth. God said it, but it's not happening, so you need to go ahead and take care of it. Or deception. Believe the lie. Believe what Satan said, the wicked one. And Jesus says this in verse 10, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship God and serve him only. Here it is. I wrote this down. I didn't put it in your notes because I didn't have room. But listen, can you put it up? Um, yeah, here it is. Listen. When God is ready, he will feed me. That's really the first temptation. He's trying to tempt him saying, Listen, God isn't taking care of your needs. Listen, when God is ready, he'll meet your need. You can trust him. Are you with me, church? We do this. This is, this is one of the fiery darts he shoots at us. Oh, my needs aren't being met. This isn't happening, God. It's not ta you're taking too long. And so you take matters into your own hands and you try to do it yourself. When God is ready, he'll meet your need. Listen, here's the next one. When God is ready, 
he'll anoint me Messiah and King. This is Jesus. When God is ready, he's going to take care of all that. And yes, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But you know what he had to go through? He had to go through the cross. He didn't give in to the vision. He put up his shield of faith and he blocked this, 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 this um, uh, what is it? Not denial. Yeah, it's denial. Denial that Jesus is going to do what he says. And then listen, when God is ready, he will give me the kingdoms of this world. That's the last one for Jesus. When God's ready, he'll give me the kingdoms, but not right now. And some of you need to get that today. You want it right now. And God's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. If I give it to you right now, it's going to mess you up. And God's like, I got a plan. You got to trust me. You got to put your confidence in me in who I said I am and what I wrote in God's word. You can trust me. You don't have to doubt or deny or be deceived. You don't have to let those arrows uh, go through your, 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 your shield of faith. You can stand knowing God's word. Closing with this verse. You ready? And then we're done. We're praying. Here we go. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Isn't that great news? Everyone who's born of God overcomes the world. How do they do it? You ready? This is the victory that has overcome the world. What is it? Even our faith. Faith is so crucial. The shield of faith. You've heard about it for two weeks now. The shield of faith. Put it up. Take it up. Align yourself with the truth of who God is. Believe. Put your confidence, your trust, that he can be trusted, that he will meet your need when, when he's ready, that he will take care of you when he's ready, that he has things for you when he's ready for you. You've got to trust him. You've got to keep your faith up. Stand with me, church. Listen, don't miss next week, man. Sword of the Spirit. I'm so excited. It's going to be fantastic. Um, let me pray for us. God, we, uh, we've heard your word today, and now we want to live it. It's not enough just to hear your word, but we want to we want to we want to stand on your word. And so we do that today, Lord. We pick up our shields of faith. And when temptation comes, and it's we know it's coming this week. When the enemy comes and puts that thought in our mind or say do this or say this or go there or look at that, God, we will take that thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. That our shield of faith will be up. And we will trust you. We pray all this in Jesus name. And the church said, listen, if anybody needs prayer, I'm at the piano. God bless you. Please greet each other.